<laughs> Welcome to Monster Chiller Thriller 10! <laughs> Yes, this is the 10th episode, the 10th year of Monster Chiller Thriller, the Halloween special. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your ghoulish host, Mark Fusco. And uh, we're going to celebrate some Halloween uh, goodies here. As you can see, we're doing something a little different this year uh, than I've done in previous years. I've got a mead, I've got a wine, and I have a tequila. So this is the first time I've done an actual review of a spirit, and the first time I've done an actual review of a mead. Um, I've done some spirits in interviews uh, earlier this year um, with the Gin and Genevieve over at uh, the Kato Conference. Did I start everything? I said I did. Okay. So making sure. Um, <laughs> after I did all that, I got like stuff hanging out here. Ugh. Anyway. We're good. All right, so let's get into let's get into all this. Um, I tried to dim the lights a little bit, but the phone is really trying to overcompensate for the um, for the exposure. So uh, definitely gonna dim all this in post. But uh, hopefully everything's in the shot. It looks like it is. I had to scrunch everything in. Um, so yeah. So let's get into some mead. All right. So what is the first one we're gonna do here? Uh, so what, first of all, what is mead? All right, so mead is either a honeyed beer or a honeyed wine. It's kind of in between. It is a fermented beverage, uh, which honey is the main uh, ingredient. So it's created for, with, by fermenting honey with water, sometimes with various fruits, spices, grains, or hops. Um, alcohol content ranges anywhere from three and a half to 20%. So we've got, um, this is called Viking Blood Mead by from Dansk Mjöld. Hold on, let's have Google Translate tell us how it's pronounced. Ready? Dansk Mjöld. Dansk Mjöld. One more time. Dansk Mjöld. All right, get that? Cool, got it. All right, so <laughs> anyway, so uh, there's no vintage on this, but uh, this cost me about. 30 ish dollars um it, it i found it on total wine for like 28 27 i bought it from a co-worker uh where i work uh she's like totally into this and uh, i told her i've had it so it says a nordic honey wine with hibiscus and hops added so um like you said you'll and 19 percent alcohol so um they they don't have a lot on their website They're, they do have a website and um i should have like taken the plastic off on this ahead of time but uh, anyway, so it says, in order to establish this mead, we have combined the traditional brew with dried hibiscus. In addition to, to color, this spice adds an aromatic uh, and floral aftertaste to this mead like a good Madeira. Uh, and it says, content honey, added water, ginger, and hibiscus. 90% um, alcohol. Man, I really should have, oh, wait a minute, there's a little, Heck yeah. All right. Shoo. Okay, so um, so as you know that the, the, the show is stuff I've never had before. I'm making an exception for this Viking blood um, because, oh, there's stuff on the back. I can barely read it. The world's oldest fermented beverage uh, made from honey uh, has been a popular drink from Europe to Australia dating back to long before the Vikings, Viking times. One of the earliest references to fermented honey can be found in the Hindus of uh, India's holy books, the Veda books, which date back to well, date back 4,000 years and possibly even earlier than that. Um, actually, this is what the Wikipedia entry says. I'm not gonna read the whole Wikipedia entry, um, but I'll have a link to it, so if you wanna go to it. Uh, there's only a couple more paragraphs. Uh, the oldest known recipe for mead to be written down in, in the Nordic countries was in 1520 by the Archbishop uh, Olaus Magnus. Uh, the recipe comprised of water, honey, hops, and brewer's yeast and concludes that on the eighth day it may be drunk, but the longer it is left, the purer and better it will be. 
And then they say our products are 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 brewed, our products are brewed based on a recipe from about the year 1700, and the ingredients are pure and 100% natural, guaranteed free from additives and any kind. Honey is the major and most important item in the recipe. All right, so it's from uh, Denmark, Danish. So it's a Danish uh, uh, thing. So uh, again, I was gonna say, like, I guess you can call it full disclosure. I've had this product, but I've had it in a cocktail, not on its own. So there's a there's a bar I go to every once in a great while. It's called the Thirsty Camel, and uh, they have a drink called the Valhalla, and it's effectively a Moscow Mule, except instead of vodka, they use this. Super tasty. They serve it in this um, uh, kind of chalice, like like a, more of a champagne flute, pewter champagne flute. So it stays super cold. So luckily you have a stem to hold it by instead of this because you're not going to be able to hold it. And um, uh, it's super tasty, super dangerous. Like you, you're, you're going to, hi Horatio, how are you doing today? Doing all right? Um, so I uh, always had to have my Shakespeare reference. So um, you want some? Anyway, um, sorry, I amused myself too much. So they have their super tasty, but if you order it and they don't know who you are, they ask you for your ID. Like they take your ID because people take the glass or the, the, the pewter cup. So um, super cool. Um, it's kind of a unusual bar. They play a lot of techno trance type of stuff, goth. Um, I did a Halloween karaoke there once where we, we had to sign, um, not NDAs, we had to sign like waivers because we were using helium um, to sing. That was a lot of fun. But uh, anyway, so let's try the mead on its own. All right, so yeah, honey, of course, right? But it, it's, I get the ginger, but um, I guess it goes with floral too. I don't really know what hibiscus normally actually smells like, but it's kind of like a tea almost. Like it's got a tea with honey. It actually almost smells like a, a tea with a ton of honey in it. Yeah. Oh, I'm excited to try it. Wow. So you, it, it, there's a bit of a medicine-y taste to it, but I can totally see how this particular mead is used in that Valhalla. It's really the overriding flavor in that drink. They do add ginger beer to it, but the ginger's in there, and it has a prickliness, kind of like a ginger beer. Like, this is almost just that, but you replace the vodka with this, and then you make it, like, ice cold. Like, this is pretty much room temperature now. Like, I pulled all the wines I did, so I did, you know, all seven episodes, and this is number seven. Uh, so I did them all in one shot, but I pulled all the wines out at the same time, so this stuff was been out the longest. But um, yeah, and there's like this um, caramel, um, uh, kind of a honeycomb, um, like more honeycomb, almost like that cereal honeycomb. I haven't had that in a long time. They still make it. That was, that was, that was some good cereal. Yeah, um, I'm excited to come to Crow is still working, so I'm, I don't have to like look over at the Evixia. But there's a little bit of a medicine kind of quality to it, but it is super tasty, like, and dangerous. It's like 19, it's like pork, 19% alcohol. Thank goodness I do the Halloween episode on its own, and uh, there isn't enough room for the spit bucket. Like, I guess I could have it off to the side if I want to, but you know me, I don't spit during Halloween, because the last, this is the last episode of, the, of, the, um, of what I'm doing, so. Man, this is awesome. <laughs> yes. I'm going to put this glass aside because I'm going to get my other glass here. So let's move on to um, let's move on to the wine that we're going to do. So um, so I was looking for a wine and I was hanging out at Central Market and I saw this wine and while the name itself oh yeah I meant to pull that pull that uh 
There we go. I meant to pull that up. Um, no, not that. So, uh, I saw this wine, and the, while the, the name itself isn't really Halloween-y, um, the, 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 the monster that's on there is. So, um, I've, here we go. So, anyway, so Juggernaut. So this is the 2017 Juggernaut Cabernet Sauvignon, paid $29.95 at Central Market. Um, this is definitely widely available. It's actually made by the Bogle family. And you don't, there's nowhere on the Juggernaut website that tells you that it's from Bogle. Um, but if you search on the Google um, well enough, you'll eventually uh, come across that Bogle actually makes it. So, heavy bottle too, man. That's funny. Woo! All right. It came out easier than going in. That's what she said. Anyway, uh, sorry, I had to throw that in there. <laughs> All right. So let's put this back up front. You got a good, you got a good look at the label. I don't need to put it up front. So let's check this one out. Um, so it was a juggernaut. So um, this was really interesting. I'll have a link to this too. So you can look at it on, on the Wikipedia page. Um, so you don't get the Juggernaut comic book uh, villain or whatever it is. So it is a, uh, in current English usage, it is a literal or metaphorical force regarded as mercilessly destructive and unstoppable. That sounds pretty scary, right? That's Halloween-ish. Uh, the usage originated in the mid 19th century. So uh, the figurative sense of the word has origins and mechanics co comparable to figurative uses of steamroller or battering ram to mean something overwhelming in ground its ground in social behavior is similar to that of bandwagon but with overtones of devotional sacrifice in British English uh, meaning of a large heavy truck or articulated lorry uh, dates from the second half of the 20th century now it is derived from the Sanskrit Odia Jagannatha, um, or World Lord, combining Jagata, meaning world, and Natha, Lord, which is one of the names of Krishna found in the Sanskrit epics. So it's a what they call a loan word, and uh, the English loan word juggernaut in the sense of a huge wagon bearing an image of a Hindu god is from the 17th century, inspired by the uh, Jagannatha Temple in Puri, Odisha, or Orissa, which has the Ratha Yatra chariot procession, uh, an annual procession of chariots carrying the, uh, there we go, make that a little bigger, carrying the Murtis, or statues, of Jagannatha Subhadra and Balabhadra. Balabhadra. The first European description of this festival is found in the 13th century account by the Franciscan monk and missionary Odric of uh, Pordenone, who describes Hindus as a religious sacrifice, cast, uh, or sorry, Hindus, not Hindus, so describes Hindus as a religious sacrifice, casting themselves under the wheels of these huge chariots and being crushed to death. If this isn't Halloween wine, I don't know what it is. Um, Odoric's description was later taken up and elaborated upon in the popular 14th century travels of John Mandeville. Others have suggested more prosaically that the deaths, if any, were accidental and caused by the press of the crowd and the general commotion. So, um, and I'll, I'll stop there because that's basically give you a good description. They've got some pictures on the Wikipedia site. Uh, maybe if I remember, I'll throw them up there. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of them like, dude, these things are massive, and yeah, um, I can see like if the crowd's like pushing in, and you get like kind of knocked down, you're and you get under this thing, you're, you're not, you're not surviving. So let's see what kind of wine it is. Uh, anyway, so let's let's go to the let's go to the let's go to the website itself. So um, they're from Hillside Vineyards, um, 
when they say why. Why do they take the hillside? So steep hillside vineyards present the ultimate challenge. Mountainous terrain tests both the grower and the vine. Um, so they have less access to water with rockier soil, also holding f fewer nutrients. So if you remember, with wine, we actually want it to struggle. So really fertile land for vines is great. They love it. It's just they don't really make good wine. They make very diluted or thin wines. If you make the vine struggle just a little bit, it doesn't have to be like a lot, but just a little bit, um, you get more concentration of fruit. So that's so on mountains, because you have less fertile soil than say in the valley floor, you automatically have that struggle. Um, so they stress the vine, resulting in production of a fraction of the fruit in most vineyards. Harsh environment causes, I already talked about that. Fewer clusters and smaller berry size. Uh, most of the flavor resides in the grape skin, so the result is berries that are loaded with rich, ripe, intense, intensely concentrated flavors and complexity. Um, they use French oak to age it, but they don't tell you how much. Um, they, get the, they get the grapes from Livermore Valley, Sierra Foothills, Alexander Valley, and Lake County. Uh, it, is spent, it does spend 12 to 18 months in new French oak, but they don't tell you how much of it's new. Um, let's see here. Yeah, and that's about, that's about it. That's about it to talk about. Um, but yeah, Vogel is the actual company that makes the wine. So let's check it out, dudes. Yeah, you can tell it has a bunch of French oak on it. So, like, yeah, tons of black and red fruits, vanilla for days. Um, I, this actually smells kind of expensive. Like, it smells like it's more than a $30 bottle of wine. I mean, this is not cheap by any means. I mean, none of the stuff I'm reviewing today is cheap. But yeah, just like ripe fruit, raspberry, blackberry, no, that's about it. Raspberry and blackberry as far as the fruits. A little bit of blueberry too. And vanilla for days. Um, like cedar box. Um, clove. That kind of stuff. Let's check it out. So it's got a little bit of a bourbon barrel quality to it. I know it's not Asian bourbon barrels. But it's kind of a thing I've been seeing that there's wines that have been aged in those types of, or non-wine barrels. Um, so it's kind of like the opposite of like, you know, these, these liquors that have been aged in wine barrels. Um, so they're kind of like reversing it. Um, but you get like, definitely the alcohol is kind of high. I don't know if they say it on here. Let's see. Let's see this for the alcohol. 14 and a half. It's probably higher than that. Um, so quick tip. If they if, if the alcohol ends in zero or five, then it's not they're not being precise. And you've got at fourteen and a half, you've got like a one percent wiggle room, if I remember right. So it could be as high as fifteen and a half. It could be as low as thirteen and a half. And it's not thirteen and a half. I'll tell you that much. Um, but if you see like fourteen point seven, like you see like a point two, a point three, a point seven, a point nine, or whatever, anything but point five or point zero, then that wine probably is exactly that alcohol level. So, um, yeah. But yeah, this is, this is powerful stuff. Not quite as powerful as the mead, but you drink these two bottles, yeah, you're, you're laid out, man, by yourself. All right, so is it good? Do you like really uh, big, bold fruit, high octane wine? With like a lot, of good amount of vanilla, and that that um, um, oaky characteristic, and kind of that bourbon, like more of a bourbon barrel than this like whiskey, but like that whiskey bourbon, you know those lactones that are in there. If you like red wines like that, you will absolutely love this. And it's well made in that sense. Is it my style of wine? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes I I just want a wine that tastes like this. Like, it doesn't have to be all fancy and sophisticated and poofy. Like, I like New World wines. I like Old World wines. I like wines from everywhere. I like Napa cabs that taste like this. Um, do I like these all the time? No, but sometimes, man, that's what I want. I want something that's just like delicious and I don't really care who makes it. 
Um, if it tastes good, I'm happy. So yeah, you want to spend 30 bucks on a bottle of wine for your Halloween party? It's a little expensive for a Halloween party, but say it's like a small gathering, I don't know. Or you're, or like, you know, not everyone's going to drink wine. And they're going to drink like beer and tequila and other stuff. And only people are going to drink wine, but you want to bring something nice? Yeah, you can totally bring this. Pair this with like Kit Kat bars and stuff like that. Yeah, dude. Milk duds, all kinds of cool stuff. All right, I forgot to set something up, but anyway. So let's move on to um, tequila. So, man, did I go down a rabbit hole today doing research on, on this particular tequila, but just tequila in general. So, what I knew about tequila was, has to be blue agave, 100% uh, blue agave, and um, otherwise, it's, uh, if it's like not 100%, then it's called mix, mixto, and they can put up to 49% like just sugar in, in there to like mix with the agave. Um, to create like a, a tequila cocktail or a mixto. And, um, but you know, there's, there's different ways to make, make tequila. And just like there's different ways to make everything that's, well, everything, but alcohol, right? So uh, I'm going to put links to all this. I'm not going to go through all these websites because there's a lot of websites to go through. But, um, so Long Island Lou, uh, tequila, uh, it's a website that I guess reviews tequilas. So, um, They've got a, um, I don't know if, there's a picture of a lady and there's a picture of a guy. I'm assuming Lou as an L-O-U is probably the guy, but um, the woman might be his wife. Um, so they have like a little a blurb about the, about the tequila from a couple of years ago. Um, I didn't read the whole thing because I want to get into the actual tasting notes of the tequila. But it's, it's actually made by, and, and I, I found, I, oh sorry. So it's, <laughs> what is the tequila? So it's the Skelly Tequila Añejo, uh, fifty-four ninety-nine from Total Wine. All right. So um, it is made by uh, where are these guys? I'm trying to find the. I was just looking in the back. I think I can read it. So it is made by. Um, uh, Azulejos, um, so Casa Azulejos, Los Az Azulejos. So, um, where are we at? Right here. Yes. So, Azulejos is actually, um, and uh, you go to the website, you can see it a little bit better, but there's like these ceramic tiles that are made in, um, uh, where is it made? Our history, quick, come on, pull it up. Um, it's a Flash website, which, you know, kind of get with the times, dude, like HTML5, come on, man. Um, so it is, I think it's Puebla, they make these little tiles and they're like, they use it everywhere. They're handmade and hand painted. So this is a handmade ceramic bottle, hand painted. All right. So another reason why it's probably like 55 bucks. Um, but it's considered a premium tequila. Um, but here's some things about tequilas that you may not know. I definitely didn't know. Um, so there's different ways of cooking. So what happens is, so you have the, the agave plant and tequila has to be blue agave. Mezcal can be like all these other um, species of agave. So um, so the agave, you know, has like these like leaves that are huge. They have to cut them off so you get what's called the pina. Um, so the heart of it. And depending on how close you cut to the, to the edge, you get better and better quality or, or flavor or purity. Um, if you leave the leaves on you don't, or you don't cut them completely, you get some bitterness. But there's ways of cooking this pina and what the cooking process does is it releases the sugar. Because so think of it like every liquor, they actually go through a, they go through some way of releasing the sugar or, or, or exposing the part of the plant or the whatever the, they're using to make the the, uh, the spirit that's why I spirit you know the spirits Woo! Um, so they have to make it so that the where the carbohydrates are are exposed enough so that they can be converted into sugar and then once that happens then they brew it 
or ferment it. So like wine, but basically every spirit is a beer first. It's a wort and all that. And then they distill that wort or that beer um, and they distill it at least once, sometimes two, three, four, 12, 15 times, whatever, um, to raise the alcohol level and then to, you know, to get pure, get impurities out and all that kind of stuff. So, but when they cook these pinas, uh, there's different ways of doing it. So you can just put them in the ground, um, you roast them. So you have like a fire underneath and then you have like, like I think a layer of coal or whatever, and then you bury it. And this is actually how mezcal is made. So the pinas are, are roasted. That's why most mezcals have a smoky characteristic. There's really no tequilas that do this. There's like very, very, very few. Um, but there are like, I think it's like one that goes this way, maybe a couple. But then you have like what they call ovens or hornos. Um, and they're clay, stone, or ceramic, and they use steam instead of direct heat. So they're, they're not cooked, they're steamed, right? Then you've got um, what they call autoclaves, and uh, they also use steam, but they use high pressure with the steam, so it takes way less time. So with the, with, with the buried method, it can take days for these things to be ready. Um, with the hornos, um, they take still a couple of days, like 24 to like 50 or 60 hours. That includes the cooling off period. So it takes like 24 hours for these pinas to cool down. Um, autoclaves take like a few hours. They're, they're done within a day. And then they have something called a diffuser, <clears throat> which is like how all the really cheap stuff is made. Um, and like they call out people that like, these well, websites I'll we have links to, they call out people that are like kind of premium tequilas they use diffusers. Then after that, <clears throat> um, you've got, um, you got what still they use. So are they using a pot still? Or are they using a column still? They're using combinations of the, of the two. So column stills are going to give you, if they just use a column still, um, that's going to give you the most neutral of neutral like spirits in general because it's like multiple distillations at once uh, versus a pot still and, and doing multiple pot stills, a column still, depending on how many um, plates you have, is the equivalent of that many distillation. So if somebody goes, our vodka is distilled 12 times, well, they use a column still, um, or it's also a coffee still, C-O-F-F-E-Y, because that's the person who invented it or, or perfected it or whatever. Um, there's 12 plates in there, or there's five plates if they use a column still. If they actually truly distill it five times in a pot still, then that's what they did. They, they distilled it and they filled it up again, distilled it again. Whereas a column still, it's they count the plates as distillations. Um, so these websites, like these are all like the, the tequila like experts and like nerds. Um, they talk about how like that type of process where if you use diffuser and column still, which is usually what happens with like the really cheap stuff, um, even though it's 100% blue agave, because it has to be because it's tequila, um, it's like the equivalent of vodka. Like they call it uh, uh, ag ag vodka or something like that. Kind of funny. But um, anyway, so Skelly. So uh, it's the, the parent company, and I don't have it up. I don't know why I don't have it up here. Um, but on the back, uh, it's actually made, so like, so whiskeys in the United States. So a lot of whiskeys are made at the same distillery, but then they get aged differently. So tequila does the same thing. Um, there's lots of actual distilleries or you know, they do the whole process between the cooking and the, and the distilling and the fermenting. So this is actually made by the, um, here we go, by the Dest, uh, Crimony, Desladora del Valle, Valle probably, de tequila, um, and they have a, there's a number on the back of every tequila bottle. And if you look up the, it's called the NOM, the NOM, which I can't remember what it stands for, but you know, it's like, you know, a Mexican regulation. Um, and it's 1438 is their NOM number. So you can, you can go into Google, you can go into Google and you can type NOM 1438. And I'd put the word tequila next to it. And voila, there's a, there's like tequila.net and 
Um, they'll tell you, you know, every tequila that's made at that distillery. And it's basically the same parent company. Um, so yeah, I, for some reason I didn't have this, this website up. So, um, so it's kind of like whiskey, like maybe the same mash bill. So like, I think it's like Weller 12 and Pappy 10 uh, are the same mash bill, but then they're aged a little bit different, so they're gonna taste slightly different, but they use the same recipe, base recipe, of, you know, what percentage of corn and grain and all that stuff. All right, so um, every hat is individual. Like this is handmade. Like the, the, the hats are hand painted, handmade. Um, he's got the mustache. <laughs> That's cool. Um, got the got the got the cross thing. I don't know what these are called, but the the armor. I meant the armor. The ammo belts. Um, but the the there's variation to the hats, different colors of the hats, and all that. So let's. Um, oh, because these are handmade. Um, so the the volume of these of these bottles are going to be a little different. So. Uh, people, when I was at Total Wine, and uh, a friend of mine works there, when, uh, uh, anyway, so one of the other guys who told me a little bit about the tequila said that people sometimes complain that, you know, one tequila has, the, the fill level is different. Well, that's because these are handmade. So it's filled with 750, 750 milliliters of tequila, because it's, that, that part's made, that part's like automated, but it, but the fill level may be in different, may end up in different spots because they're not all, like, whatever. So let's rip his head off. Ah! Ooh, maybe I should, maybe I should, should do the uh, Wilhelm scream on that. Hopefully I did. I can totally smell it now. So, where, I got I got where's my glass? Oh yeah, I've got the glass here. So, a different glass. I don't drink tequila a lot, but I really wanted, like, a spirit to be in the theme of Halloween that had something that could be, like, a Halloween theme and um, so I saw this now there's like um, there's like a whiskey called Devil's River Whiskey that sounded like a good idea and I like whiskey I don't really drink tequila I'm, I'm usually not a tequila fan it's gotta be like like high-end tequila for me to like it that's hat staying off anyway I guess you can pull it that way um, this thing was really hard to pull it off but uh here Horatio you can wear the hat all right um so uh yeah I'm not really a tequila fan but if it's like super good tequila then I can I can handle it but it was kind of funny because one of the tequilas I consider like really really good apparently uses the diffuser method so they so what they can do with tequila is they can add in flavors to make it taste like it went through, say, the the um, the normal like cooking method, or even the um, uh, autoclave. So what was that method again called? I don't remember. Um, the Ornos. It's probably where they get the word "pernitos" from, from salsa. But they don't use those. They use diffusers, I think. Actually, maybe some autoclave. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they call it these like major brands, like Casa Dragones. This is one of those, like, they're like $50, $50, $7,500 bottles of retail. And uh, Plaza Azul, um, another one that's, I, I think it's really good to keep. And it has like a little silver bell on top. Like, it's like a bell, like you ring it. It just happened to be that way. Um, but, so let's check this out. So, what, so what, what's a reposado? So, you have Blanco, which is like, as soon as it's distilled, they bottle it, right? Really no aging. Then you have reposado. So it can age up to, but not including 12 months. And then, uh, and Yeho is 12 months up to, I think eight, no, up to 24 months. Man, I had this all looked up and then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, just, we'll look it up real quick. Um, here we go, types of healer classifications. So uh, Blanco or silver, uh, basically no aging. Then you have Gold or Hoven. Um, so, but that's usually a mixto. And then uh, Reposado, rested and aged between two months and 11 months. Uh, Reposado, I'm sorry, um, Añejo is, um, where does it say? It doesn't say. 
since it's extra, oh, at least one year, right? So at least one year, and then extra añejo, um, or ultra aged. So that's that's a new classification as of 2006. It has to be aged more than three years. So añejo can be up to three years. I, I was pretty sure it was, that's what it was, um, but I didn't want to like say it and then be wrong. Uh, but then extra añejo is minimum three years. All right, so let's check it out. So you know we got the golden color from the aging, not from not from caramel or coloring added. So that's what gold is. It's not only really aged; they just add the color to it, right? And also, just you know, like uh, cognacs, armagnacs, things like that, they can actually add caramel color also. So not quite smoky, but you've got like a somewhat of a roasted character. Oh yeah, so like these websites were talking about like how you roast and how you or cook. The, the piñas really gives you like the characteristic, but if you use the diffuser, you can add those flavors back in. But they say it usually tastes more medicine-y, even though the flavor's there, it's not like, it's like, like integrated, right? So even though the flavor's there, it's not, it doesn't taste quite right. So, I want to say it's smoky, but there's like a roasted quality to it. There is a caramel. Almost like a banana. I'm trying not to have the tastiness for this particular tequila in front of me. I saw pepper real quick, and I, I don't really get the pepper. At least not on the nose. Um, there's like a, a slight citrus note to it. Yeah, that's about it. I don't want like my nose to like it. Like, to, I mean, I'm really trying to breathe through my mouth more than my nose because you don't really want to do like just directly put your nose in and just like sniff because then you'll like burn your nose hairs. I mean, this stuff is like, you know, 40% alcohol. It's 80 proof. So you open your mouth and you, you put your nose there, but you breathe through your mouth so it kind of retro-nasally gets it in there. All right, let's just taste it. Salty. I mean, I don't drink a lot of tequila, right? Like, so what I do? Oh, the pepper is there. Um, wow, wow. Like, this is like really. Starting, let me finish my thought first, because it's going to keep lingering. I don't drink a lot of tequila. I typically don't like the flavor of tequila, but it's because I've had a lot of like bad tequila. But when I have good tequila, and I'm going to consider it's good tequila because I'm, I'm really kind of liking it. Um, that I can, that I can totally like, like sip on. This is sipping tequila. This is not stuff you're gonna take shots of. You want to, I guess you could, but why do that? You're wasting, like you're, like you're not enjoying it. But yeah, like this is like Gruner, like white pepper, like for freaking days, like over your head. But it's on the palate, not the nose. But there's like this, the banana's kind of there, uh, caramel. Um, a little citrus, a little orange. Now that I've tasted it, I kind of get the pepper again. In general, it's actually pretty smooth. Especially after the first swallow, your palate gets, you know, gets acclimated to the higher alcohol, especially since I was only doing 15 and 14 and 13 percent alcohol. Um, it's spicy, um, it's peppery, it's spicy, it's, it's like white pepper more than any other type of pepper, but even like little like chiles, like little red, red chilies, chiles, whatever, um, almost pyrazine quality, um, which I'm sorry, that's like bell pepper, green pepper, um, um, peppercorn, um, so it's, it's a lot of pepper to this, like it's just a lot of different types of pepper. Um, but it's a, it's a touch smoky um, or more roasted, but like roasted corn. Yeah, the cor there's a little bit of corn quality to it, like a roasted corn. Not like, you know, a couple, few episodes ago where I said like burnt popcorn. This is more like a roasted corn, not quite elote, which if you don't know what elote is, you should have some. It's basically a corn on the cob they roast, like put on the grill. 
and usually it's sweet corn, so it's like super tasty. So it's kind of like that. Um, so it's probably from, even though they don't use corn in this, um, it, since it's aged in oak barrels, like whiskey is and bourbons are, are aged, you're probably getting like the whiskey lactones from from the aging, so it kind of like kind of goes hand in hand with the corn flavor, but it's not like like over the top. Uh, but yeah, vanilla. Yeah, I get the vanilla more on the on the nose now. It's like vanilla caramel, like candy. Yeah, or like like a vanilla like a vanilla candle, but these aren't scented. You know, this 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 candle actually has some purple in it, which I know you can't see, but I've used this candle for like maybe not the whole maybe not every episode, but for like the last like five or six episodes. And I just noticed today it actually has some purple in it, which I love. The purple, the purple color. Skull Vikings, that's why. Viking blood. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty intense. I'm telling you, man. But it's good. Maybe some of these tequila aficionados and, and snobs will be like, no, man, that's like the prisoner of tequila. Because, you know, prisoner is prisoner. Hey, again, if you like prisoner, like, this is kind of like prisoner. If you like prisoner, then rock on, dude. So I got a surprise for you. So I, I, I didn't set it up ahead of time. Now I'm making shadows on the green screen here because right in front of the freaking light. So, um... Like I said, I always review stuff I've never had before. So unfortunately, this product would have been the perfect thing to use for, for as a spirit of some sort um, for Halloween, but I drink this quite a bit. So you may have already seen what I had, or you may think you see what I had because of the color. But anyway, so this is Licore Strega. So Strega means witch in Italian. So yeah, how, how cool is that? So um, so what is Strega? And I'll have a link below to it. I didn't, I didn't pull up the Wikipedia on it. Uh, and then I'll, I pretty much know what Strega is, but I still need to be reminded. It's, uh, it's a liqueur, and it's mostly, I get more licorice or anise from it, but um, it's also got saffron in it. It's similar to Galliano, especially of the color. It's like that antifreeze yellow to it. Um, and it's, uh, uh, you can tell I've already had some. Like, I mean, I've had this bottle for like, not quite a year, I've had it for like, I bought it like in January. So I obviously don't drink a whole lot of it. I, I drink it very rarely, but I drink a lot of it at Texom. So if you follow me on, on the gram and Facebook and all that, then you see I have pictures every year of me drinking Strega at Texom at the Four Seasons, because I basically have a personal bottle. All right, so, it's like a liqueur. It is a liqueur um, with a ton of herbs. It's one of those liqueurs that, um, what was the price still on here? So this is 35 bucks at the Austin Wine Merchant. So I only went there once, but they got some awesome stuff. So here you go, it's the mega. Um, but a bunch of herbs. It's like one of those things where like only two people in the whole world at any point in time know the, the actual recipe. It's like a secret, you know, guarded secret. Um, so, but I love this stuff. And now I just poured it straight. Normally I put it on the rocks with a splash of water because it really cuts it. I haven't had it straight in a while. And I just remember it was like kind of pungent, kind of like not really that great straight. And that's how I had it when I first would try it. And my dad is the one who got, who got me into this. So one day I said something about it and he goes, well, this is how I drink it. I never really paid attention to how you drink it. And so I tried it that way and I was like, Oh my God, like it's way better. So it's kind of like, you know, you drink like a scotch or a whiskey and they're super powerful, right? But you cut it with, you know, rocks with a touch of water, not a lot of water, just a splash of water. And it helps cut, cuts it and it like, it like calms it down, makes it more palatable. That's what you do with Strega. So like it's sweet smelling, like it is sweet. It's sweet smelling. Um, ginger also in that the the licorice and the saffron are like the overwhelming aromas on this stuff um it's very sweet smelling it's also very similar to yellow chartreuse not green chartreuse but yellow chartreuse like if if the bar doesn't have strega which 
outside of the northeast, you know, back east, they, they you know, more bars will probably have it because of the Italian community. But um, if, if a bar is like a higher end bar and they don't have Strega, they have, they'll probably have Galliano, which I, have, I can't remember last time I had Galliano, right? but it's definitely not, it's not, it's not the same. But Yellow Shop Truce is pretty darn close. And close enough. Like it to work. But yeah, it's kind of sweet smelling, almost candied, um, like orange. And orange has been like the overriding theme today for me smelling stuff. But orange, apricot. Um, this is actually the first time I've actually like analyzed Strega. I usually just drink it. Um, the saffron, the ginger. Um, and then uh, um, some s just like sweet herbs and stuff like that. Let's taste it. Yeah, that's pretty. It's not. I mean, it's, I think it's like it's just forty proof. I mean, it's eighty proof, so it's forty. You know, it's something like the same as this, same as vodka. I mean, this is like strong stuff, but it's strong in flavor right now. And yeah, there's a reason you cut it. Um, I mean, I could drink it on its own if I really wanted to. I mean, I, I'm used to the flavor now that I could probably drink it straight. But, um, it's more enjoyable to drink it the way I normally do. But, it is sweet. It is candied. Um, it's candied orange. It's marmalade. It's like those, those oranges, like those candy oranges. Like, it's not even orange. Like, it's just sugar. Like, it's formed into an orange slice with a more sugar on it. It's kind of like that. Um, with the ginger, with the saffron, with the anise, um, um, but it's like a sweet licorice. And now that I've tasted it straight, I, the licorice is actually not the first. I, I always get licorice on it, but it's not as it's not as prominent now. Yeah. So if you were looking for something kind of cool, kind of different. Um, I'll put a link for like cocktails and like that. I don't know of any cocktails off the top of my head that you make from this stuff. If you want something that's like for a Halloween party, you can find this. I mean, you can tell you, say, hey, it means witch in Italian. Um, and uh, it's been around since like the 1700s, 1750 or something like that. Um, I'll put the Wikipedia page just so that I have it ready for the link. Um, there we go. Uh, sorry, 1860. Um, and uh, it's from actually uh, the other thing is it's kind of from my family's home not quite we're actually not from Campania but my family lives in Campania now um, but uh, so it's also from Campania so what what um, and then uh, oh yeah the witches of Benevento oh, I should look that up too I don't remember seeing that but uh, yeah, it's, it's a cool little thing. It's different, it's not Galliano. It's the other yellow Italian liqueur. Um, it's tasty, some people love it, some people hate it. But um, I know that pretty much I'm the only who drinks it, it's Texan, so I always have my own personal bottle. I drank one bottle um, during the conference, but remember, I'm there for like eight days. So it doesn't take long to, if you drink it every day, like a couple drinks, like two drinks a day of it, it doesn't take long to get through a whole bottle. Yeah, maybe I have a little extra in there. Um, but they have like one more bottle for me for next year. Though, I'm thinking, I'm hoping to go up to Tiwa with the Texan International Wine Awards in February. So, and it's at the Four Seasons again. But I probably won't stay at the Four Seasons because they probably won't give us a good rate. So I'll probably stay out at the Laquita across the street. Which, hey, that's totally good, man. Anyway, I'm going to crush that a little bit later. So, um, hope you had a good time. I had a good time. I always have a good time on Halloween. Seek out these items. If you're looking for some Halloween themed spirits, wines, beer, whatever you want to call that, you know, mead, um, especially that Valhalla, see if I can find, um, uh, well, I'll just post what a Moscow mule is and just replace it with, with that, the vodka with that. Um, so yeah, I hope you had a good time. I did. Um, so yeah, click the links above to friend me up. Click the links below for all the information and read that tequila stuff. It's like super eye-opening, which, you know, I didn't know the depth of tequila. Now I'm at least a little bit more knowledgeable about it. Throw some ducks my way, or Horatio's way, because I mean, he's looking kind of gaunt. 
Anyway, throw some ducats my way, uh, and we'll see if we win again next time.